Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Legend of Korra Book 2 Spirits episode commentary. This is going to be the one for K202, The Southern Lights. So, yeah, just uh, to get kind of straight into this, um, this episode I'm going to start the commentary without uh, at like basically the episode starting, so that means that the version of the episode I have doesn't have the opening on it, so get your episode ready to go at the point at where the episode actually starts, after the intro, after the title card, basically fade from white into a shot of the uh, Southern Water Tribe. So that's where I'm going to start. No intro. I'm going to start stop speaking now, and then when I start speaking again, that's when you hit play, and obviously you'll be then synced up with me. Okay, so yeah, here's the episode. This is... um. Probably one of my favorite, probably my favorite episode of the early ones, so before Beginnings. I just think this is a really important episode because a lot of it plays into what happens in Beginnings, what's explained in Beginnings, and also what happens in the finale because uh, a line that uh, Unlock tells Korra here is very important from the finale. And uh, we see straight away that they're going out on this um, expedition to the South Pole. And that this will help Kor become more spiritual and also will help the world become better. At least that's what Unalak is saying. Now, I'm aware that everyone at this point in time was already suspecting Unalak to be a villain. But I think it was almost so obvious that that's what they were going for, that it wasn't even that much of an issue for me that he actually did turn out to be a villain. I just found it interesting that it all came together in the end once this plan was explained. Now, in these early episodes we have the side plot of um, Tenzin and his family going to the air temples. And here they arrive at the uh, southern air temple. It's inhabited by monks here, as seen with this monk. I think this is just a really nice way to do it, you know, the last airbender family left visiting the temples and they're just treated with such honor. It's really kind of fun to see that head shaver. How does that work? Is do you airbend it and it just shaves your head? It looks super dangerous. And then Pema, not despite not being an airbender, you know, she's responsible for there being airbenders, so she's super honored, gets the massive amount of flowers. It's it's just really fun. <laughs> And then we cut to the next generation of airbenders, fighting like kids, and they're all like, look at those, the next generation of airbenders. <laughs> and the <laughs> mother and father are just like, those kids. And then Milo just robs a lem <laughs> lemur from the wilds and claims it as his own and calls it pokey, just uh, funny stuff. And this is a really important thing for the early episodes, and this was Tenzin's development over the whole book. People are so set and thinking that Aang and Katara had airbenders, that they completely forget that they had kids that weren't airbenders in Kaya, Waterbender, and Bumi, a non-bender. They're just like sh shocked and annoyed that they're not kind of given the same level of respect as Tenzin is as being part of this uh, important family. It's, uh, it's important, it's going to play a role in this episode and some of the next ones as well. And then on the expedition we see that um, <laughs> oh, obviously, uh, Tonrock arrives here wanting to protect his daughter, but also that Mako is trying to protect her too, and the key thing here is that she's at that point in her life where she's kind of getting away from not needing her parents, but needing them to protect her like a kid, and she's more willing to let her boyfriend kind of take on that role than Tonrock, and that's important, it kind of plays a role in this episode. And especially because of the lie revealed by Unalak about Tonrock and Tenzin last episode, She's listening to Unalak and not to her father. She's very against her father. And then this, we get this setup here that is revealed in flashback about what happened kind of between Tonrock and Unalak. And then there's that setup for something that only happens in the finale. Like, we don't see Tonrock for a large portion of this book in the middle, but then we actually do get the fight between these two brothers. It's just interesting. Seeing how much stuff, especially from this episode, that is set up, that comes back again in the finale. It's, this is this is what makes this episode really important for me in the book. 
uh, Bolin arrives uh, already um, kitted out in all this Varric gear. So Varric is definitely paying a lot of attention to Bolin. And he just interrupts a really kind of heated conversation. Lice little use of Pabu there in the kind of Momo role of like not playing a role in the scene at large but being there overall. Set <laughs> More set up for the uh, Boesca ship here. He's just like, <laughs> who's going to drive because he he, uh, he wants to sit next to Eska, but turns out it's just that uh, she wants to sit beside her brother. It's, it, it's funny how it develops, and then that scene there between the brothers, go away. <laughs> and here's the first reference we get to the spirit portal, and she's like, what? She didn't know about this, we didn't know about this. Some people complain about this episode for having too much exposition, but I think because Korra is so clueless about this spiritual stuff, it works. And exposition is only really a valid complaint when it's unnecessary explanation. In this case, it's necessary because our main character, Korra, needs to know it. And we need to know it because it's really important to the book's plot as a whole. And then, really spiritual episode. This is the episode that really kind of gets you in tune with the whole spiritual aspect of this book. Winter Solstice is tomorrow, this is the perfect time to open this portal. Even though, I suppose the timing doesn't so much matter as much, that's just one of his explanations for, like, a good place where she'll connect spiritually with this. And then we see the dark spirits kind of following them around, and later reveal that they're there because Unalak is working for Vatu, so he's basically engineered a lot of these attacks to happen so he can kind of come off best because he can use his power to defeat them while no one else can. Um, it, it's interesting like to see just Unlock's plan come together over the course of the whole book looking back on these early episodes. Here's a lovely line here from Eska. Feeble turtle duck. It, it's just an interesting line that that the reference, you know, Turtle Duck, Suzuko, and his mother was a big connection there. Spirits are angry because Tonrock is here. And interesting that you, we, through what happens later, we find out later on in like later episodes, I think the next one or maybe the one after that, it's revealed that this story is in part a lie and that much of it is engineered, most of the backstory is engineered by uh, Unalak, and that's why his uh, father banished him. And just further setting up the uh, kind of brother, uh, brother, brother conflict. And this is another lie that, um, not so much a lie, something that her father has kept from her that she felt was important, and it just further uh, plays into the whole Korra trusting her father he he's not respecting her enough to give her this information even though she's the avatar she's got an important role and she's just kind of not allowing her to do her role which is a a kind of theme throughout the a lot of this early book that Tenzin through the way he was teaching her and uh, Tonrock the way he was kind of raising her and they uh, making choices for her weren't allowing her to make those choices and so the reason that she's a bit indecisive is because she's suddenly now thrust into the situation where she's making those choices for the first time. But uh, into this flashback, interesting, we saw barbarians, which are referenced for the first time ever in Korra Avatar. I'd like to get more information on them, but I love the way Avatar as a whole does flashbacks, and this one's really good. Great, they always do great designs on like younger, older versions of characters, and seeing the younger versions here is really cool. Um, obviously, it's later revealed that the barbarians were hired by um, Unalak, and that's kind of why he, Tonrock ended up uh, fighting them here. But still, it was kind of Tonrock's choice to attack this spiritual forest, and so it still does play into the fact that he's not a spiritual person while his daughter daughter is required to be, and he's trying to keep her away from this spiritual stuff. And, you know, this plays into, I suppose, Korra's desire to be more spiritual too, maybe make amends for the family and stuff like that. And I suppose now that we later find out uh, about uh, Unlock's connection with the Dark Spirits, this scene has even more kind of, I suppose, credence to it in that um, he must have been working or known about Vatu at this point in time as well. 
I think. You know, th- th- there are obviously is some backstory with Unalak and Vati that does need to be explained, but because he can kind of, uh, he's kind of like the co- uh, commander of these dark spirits, you assume that it probably happens at this point, maybe at this stage, this is kind of where he's first hearing about uh, Vatu or something like that. Uh, maybe that's something the whole book, book as a whole could have done more, but I think there's enough there to kind of just reason out what actually happens. And here's the banishment scene. Obviously it's uh, Unalak whispering in his father's ear about what happened, telling him to be banished. And then this sets up why Tonrak ends up in the south, starts a family with Senna, has Korra. And, you know, the, the, the somewhat of, like, karma, the fact that he does something bad spiritually, but his daughter ends up being the avatar, the most spiritual person in the world. Um, really interesting thing for his character. And then here's, as, as I said, something that adds more to Korra's distrust of her father and um, desire to kind of... Just show that, as she says there, she's tired of him protecting her. And as I said in the last commentary, he has kind of been overprotecting her, keeping stuff from her, over kind of doing it in terms of like a lot of aspects of her life. Here's a really important scene here with uh, Tenzin and Janora, big setup for Janora in this episode, even though she only comes back into the main picture in the last few episodes. But we get to see this um, uh, secret part of the temple again. And Milo just destroys one of these Avatar statues, um, which by the end of the book, given what happens to the other Avatars, is really kind of like tragic. That that Avatar may not have any other statues out there. Really nice scene here. Just no lines, just Janora staring at the statue of her grandfather. Big spiritual connection you get there. And just the sense of awe in the expression. A lot of people complain about Studio Piero's animation, but look at the way they did Janora's face there. That was really nice. And then she hears like a spiritual call from the back, which is obviously the statue of Avatar 1. And just further showing us that just she has a special spiritual connection and that she's destined to be the guide of uh, Korra, not her father. And then Tonrak, instead of like apologizing, he's just trying to further convince Korra not to do anything spiritual here. And Korra's really right here when she says, you know, she has to be this spiritual person. She has to be the bridge and she has to develop spiritually. And he's kind of not allowing her to. And then Unalak, as as I said, he's been manipulating this whole situation, never allows a conversation with Korra to kind of go finished without him arriving. Then he's explaining about the, the Southern Lights, and I remember when, I, when these episodes were first coming out and we were discussing them on the podcast, I was really like, wow, this is a pretty truthful explanation, and in many ways, it plays a big role in the finale in that the portals originally were meant to be open. If they, When the world, I suppose, whatever were created, those portals were left open for a reason, not meant to be closed, and this is what was meant for the world, and that one closing them as much as it was right for that point in time, it wasn't meant to be forever. And so Korra making the decision to keep them open, even though it's what Unlock wanted, is actually the, the correct decision come the end of the book. And I, I like that episode two, these portals are addressed in. And what Unlock's saying here, despite the fact that he's manipulating Korra here and using her, is kind of correct, just he gets too crazy in terms of the spiritual aspect, and I suppose um, th- this fight here is obviously, we assume, is engineered by Unalak, he, he's kind of telling them to attack at this point in time. Uh, again, animation on these fight scenes is really good. Um, another thing with the fight scene there, Tonrock not allowing Korra to kind of get into the fight, he protects her there twice when I don't think she needed it, especially the second one. And showing that she's uh, really good at fighting herself. And here she tries to use Unalak's uh, light bending technique for the first time. I love this decision that it's not so much an ability that he ta- thought her, it's just something that she kind of got the sense that she, this is how she needs to do it. Not with brute force, not with um, anger, but by calming them down using their energies. And this is her first attempt at it, at it when she's not even that spiritual. It shows a while not a 
uh, spiritual development, but that she's willing to try something spiritual, even though she hasn't kind of done anything as such to develop spiritually just yet. I think that's important, and just um, Kor's eagerness to be the avatar that she needs to be. It's uh, good stuff for her character. But uh, yeah, I love how nonchalant the uh, twin sliding down the mountain is. It's just not even using their arms, and then <laughs> Bolin just gets spikes to get out of this uh, bubble suit that he's in. I'm surprised Pabu's uh, doing so well in the snow actually here, given that he's a fire ferret and probably he's originally from like Fire Nation, I assume. And again, you know, Tonrock speaking for Korra, you know, we're leaving, and then she says, no, you're leaving, I need to do this on my own, I can't have you here just like making these decisions for me. Important scene here, um, <laughs> Mako tells Tonrock to just let him know, I I'll look after her while you're gone, you don't need to worry, and just, I, th I thought that was a big thing for this, that relationship, and I think if Makora ends up being Endgame, I think in like book three, four, I think that'll be an important kind of scene that they had there that Mako was talking to Tanrock. And then she's angry at Tanrock, so she's angry at Mako when he starts speaking to her. I know, you see how kind of angry she is over this whole thing that she's really putting sides into people and making them, putting them on these sides and just, you know, she listens to Mako at this point in time, you know, just have to trust that people are just looking out for you and she's just kind of like, okay, but I need to do some of this on my own. And here we have the spirit forest of the South Pole um, trapped in ice because it's obviously gone unused since um, Juan closed the portal. And then Unalak says that uh, Korra has to do it alone, and then everyone kind of jumps in like, we'll protect her. And even Korra is, un is not confident at this point in time. And just hearing Unalak say that he believes in her is like tough for her to hear because not... N a lot of people have just been jumping in to like do things for her and stuff like that and so and so him just so Unlock just letting her like telling her you know, you've got to do this alone I trust in you let the avatars guide you let the light guide you it's a big moment find the light in the dark and stuff like that the big line from Unlock it's it's important and as much as you know you think like Unlock's the villain of this piece you almost get the sense that he knows that she needs some level of confidence to do this and is actually trying to help her at this moment. Even though that's probably not the case since he doesn't seem to care too much about humanity, especially come the end of this book. Uh, animation on this uh, place, at least the background animation, is really good. And I don't have too much problem with the actual uh, like Studio Piero's animation uh, with Korra and the spirits in this. Um, it's a really nice looking area. I can't wait for the uh, book 2 art book to come out to just... Uh, get some commentary on how all of this uh, stuff came about, especially the designs for these spirits, uh, the dark spirits, they look really, really interesting with the kind of the uh, colors that really contrast well with the otherwise white and blue backgrounds. <laughs> I, l I love that punch from Korra, just exploding it from the inside out. Proper airbending move there, kind of Zuko-esque firebending with the spinny, the spinny movement, it's uh, Core using airbending uh, well. And here's the spirit portal. Um, and then it, we cut back to Janora again. Really, everyone went kind of crazy about Janora after this episode because it was just like, this is the perfect way to elevate a minor character from book one into something major. And I think... We expected more, but we I think most people were happy with how it turned out. This wooden statue of uh, Juan, Juan there, later confirmed. Very interesting. And um, I find this interesting, just that nothing can crack through this ice except, you know, Korra in the Avatar state. Just that almost there's, there's something spiritual about the ice itself. It's not just that Juan closed the portal, but almost that 
Juan is responsible for this ice thing forming around it to even further protect it. It's um, it's really interesting. And then, if Unalak is indeed controlling these dark spirits, you wonder why is he having them attack her here? Is this to test her? Is this to kind of prove that she has enough power to um actually open one of these portals? It's interesting. And then this is a kind of really big scene here, as you know, she's struggling in the kind of these spirit snake vines. And then, especially the scene coming up here, where she just barely, with the tip of her finger, Avatar State touches the um, ice to unlock the portal. It's really, really powerful moment. And important in the sense of the whole season that, at this moment, she's done something very spiritual. As much as it's, in terms of the plot, puts a lot of things at risk, it was an important kind of road, uh, step on her spiritual journey that she actually did this and returned these uh, southern lights to the south. And it's a really powerful moment in the grand scheme of the whole book, and especially this when Juan's statue lights up, because the reason his statue lights up and none of the others is because he was the one who closed it in the first place, and so it being unlocked, I suppose, triggers his statue, and that was a big mystery that people were wondering about after the early episodes. Uh, Janora sees it because she's obviously destined to play a role in this kind of uh, series of events that happens. Love this scene from uh, Tonrock here as well when he's kind of uh, going away and then looks back and is just proud of her. She did it, he's not worried, he's just proud that I was wrong in this case. And then she walks out all epic like she's just done something really important. And then they add in a nice little bit of humour of the whole... <laughs> <laughs> initiating contact with another woman it's it's great after they're kind of she made them boyfriend and girlfriend it's it's great first step and that re it really was the first step on her journey as well it, it's not just him manipulating that situation or trying to be evil and then she apologizes for being <laughs> such a pain it's it, it it's nice that she realizes at this moment that she was a being very angry towards everyone, but that she admits that it was hard, and that's why she was angry about the whole thing. And that this was the big moment where everyone just went, oh no, she's being used. A lot of people were really angry about that, but I think it just it worked really well for her character that she realizes kind, not just yet that she's being used, but that she's kind of questioning now what this guy's about. And come the end of the book, she realizes that as much as this guy was evil and bad and had this hatred for humanity, he was a spiritual mentor to her. And some of the stuff he said, even if maybe he didn't mean it, to her actually mattered. And that's why I love this episode. It's um, one of the most important episodes, I think, in the early the early part of the book. Um, just to set up a lot of the stuff about harmonic convergence, the portals, spirits, and core's development over the course of the whole book. It sets up the Unalak Tonrock conflict more. And definitely, I think of the first six episodes before beginnings is my fa one, probably my favorite episode. To me, this is the equivalent of the, the revelation in book one. It's just that episode early on that's not quite as good as some of the ones later on, but it's one of the best of the early episodes. And so uh, The Southern Lights is definitely a personal favorite of mine, even if it's not the just outright uh, best episode. So thanks for listening to this episode commentary and bye.